so and they have no problem, right? And their problem was that their problem was that the, the private university and the president of the university wouldn't give them like the five hundred dollar, you know, student club money that they were supposed to get to spend on pizza, right? <laughs> so, um, so and they're they're getting back to me and they're like, we're gonna protest this. This is you know this is insane and you know and I said you're right. You should protest this and and, and <coughs> you should talk to you know other students and 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 you know everybody was like yeah whatever and I was like well. You know, maybe if you weren't just six kids in a room talking about pot, maybe if you were like, you know, which is fine, you know, but maybe if you were thinking about like the Latin American issues, you could talk to the Latino Students Union. And if you were talking about, you know, you were talking about, you know, uh, prison rage, you could talk to the Black Student Association. And if you really were talking about the drug war in a larger sense, you'd bring in more allies, right? So they started doing that, and, um, and they were brilliant. They were brilliant guys, right? And in the meantime, what was happening is, um, because the president didn't give them any money, instead of being six kids in the room, they started becoming sort of a cause celeb on the campus. Until by the end of the year, by the end of the year, they had gotten the entire campus so riled up about you know this this injustice that had happened that they got like I don't know how many people out to protest the trustees meeting at the end of the year. Okay, the whole campus is out to protest the trustees meeting. So in the meantime, we're sort of doing the higher education act stuff, but this one group is like going insane, and there's a riot. Okay? A small riot, I'm told. <laughs> but they did storm the trustees meeting, because the trustees wouldn't would meet with them. They stormed the trustees meeting, and, um, and, 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 and hilarity ensued. And so, three days after the term ends, right, we're doing the, the, the higher education stuff, I get a knock on my door at my office in Washington, D.C. And I walk, up over, I walk over and I open the door, and they're standing in front of me is a kid who's about six feet seven inches tall. <laughs> Stand up, Chris Roy. There he is. <laughs> I'm here to work here for the summer. I was like, awesome. And I, you know, I'd never seen it before. I would talk to him. He's like, I'm here to work here for the summer, and uh, maybe in the fall. <laughs> I was like, really? What happened? He's like, I might have been asked not to come back. <laughs> um, something about standing on a police car with a bullhorn and telling people to storm the trustees meeting. <laughs> within two weeks that Chris is actually the smartest human being I've ever met in my entire life. No joke, no joke. So, and, but we're about three weeks in, and we have a, and we have a, and we have a, a, a press conference, the National Press Club, and I don't even remember what the press conference is about. We will change something. And Chris comes to me, uncurls himself from his chair, and says, can I come? And he's dressed about the same as he was when he walked in the first day. And I said, I said, dude, I was like, I can't break into the press conference. I was like, I was like, I'm totally cool with the hair and the dress, it's fine, and I have long hair and whatever. I was like, but if I bring you to the press club, you're the picture. I was like, and that, and you need to understand this issue, you need to change the image, and blah, blah, blah. And Chris is like, okay, I understand. I come into work the next day, Chris has cut off his dreadlocks. Chris, Chris walks in, in a shirt and tie, with what must have been, he must have been growing his dreadlocks since he's six. <laughs> right? The dreadlocks are gone, his hair is short, he's wearing a tie. He's like, the next time you, the next time we have a press conference, I'm gonna come. I said, Chris, the next time we do anything, you will be there. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell this story for three reasons. The first is to embarrass Chris. The, most the second reason is that the, 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 what, what Chris ended up doing is he came in and we sort of made him the first national director of SSTV because like, I wasn't a student anymore and Chris was there in the office and he was working for free. And he was really smart. And we were like, okay, so can you help us do this? Because groups started to want to affiliate. They were doing, they were passing stuff on their campuses, they wanted to affiliate. And RIT had turned themselves into Students for Sensible Drug Policy before the end of the year, which was a really smart move. And so we were like, awesome, let's tell all these other students to be Students for Sensible Drug Policy. And Chris made that happen. And suddenly we had 40 chapters. Chris had 40 chapters, we had 40 chapters. And, and I tell the story, yes, to Chris, but for two other reasons. Number one, the Higher Education Act 
it was just an opportunity. It wasn't brain surgery. It wasn't rocket science. It was something that people were upset about. And you have to think like an organizer. Because you're here, I know you think like an organizer. Right? But you have to really think like an organizer. What is it that's going to get people riled up? Not just the people who already agree with you. What is it that's going to get people riled up who haven't thought about this issue? Where can you find that crack in the wall? Where can you open that? Because out of that crack in the wall, out of me writing this screed, that really was not that brilliant. It was like, wow, this is total bullshit. It has to be revealed. Go have this pass. And 13 years later, I'm standing here in front of SSDP because a bunch of kids on a bunch of campuses were like, holy shit, that's bullshit. And they did. Right. And, um, and so I'm going to wind down the story. I thought I had another reason I told that story. Mostly it was to embarrass Chris. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and I want to say that, that, you know, 13 years later, Chris is going to talk and already take too much of his time. 13 years later, we are on the cusp in this country of putting, pushing the rock off the other side of the hill, right? Um, I mentioned this to my panel, Black America has thrown up their hands, right? I know you guys have been talking about this, right? Mexico, Colombia, you know, Brazil, Guatemala, Honduras, Costa Rica, they've said, hey, let's talk about legalizing drugs, maybe. Senor, stop sending us the weapons. <laughs> right? The, the hemisphere is red. Okay? So we need the cracks in the wall here. The rest of the hemisphere is waiting to hear someone in the United States stand up and scream, we hear you. Okay? And so, and you can do this. And whether it's the marijuana legalization initiatives or anything else that you can do, think like an organizer. Find ways to get people really fired up that aren't already in this room. And I know you guys are doing it, and I appreciate it, and I'm looking to be here all day tomorrow, and I'm stoked that I want to meet all of you, so I hope I get a chance to do that. Thank you so much. So hello, everyone's energy level still high? Yeah. yeah. First of all, my name is Chris. Chris Crane, I'm the second Chris with a K, Service Executive Director of Social Drug Policy after Qualiker. Uh, thinking back to those days, and at that point I was, uh, I was an undercla uh, underclassman at American University, uh, so I wasn't particularly involved in the, uh, the, the bringing together and founding. I came in about a year later when I started really getting involved in leadership. Uh, but to imagine a, a room full of 400 students from a dozen different countries around the world is uh, it, it, was, it was inconceivable at the time. So what we've, what we've been able to accomplish as an organization in 13 years is truly astounding. Me and my speech here. Can I first say, if this is your first conference, your first SSDB conference, can you please stand? Woo! Okay, we're gonna do, we're, we've done this at conferences before, but I think it's a good time to do it. So everybody, can everybody else now stand? And this is not your first conference. About half and half. Your third or more conference, stay standing, otherwise sit down. Three or more, yeah. Three or more conferences. A lot of people have four. Four or more? Five. Well, now we're getting dead. Six. Seven. Eight. We got one of the other Nine. Ten. Ten conferences. Eleven. Oh, there is Tommy Joe. The 12 conferences. <laughs> All right, wow. <laughs> So I'll start out and talk a little bit about some of the accomplishments that we've achieved as an organization over our 13 years, and then I'm going to tell you why they're not all that important and what really is. Uh, but our accomplishments are pretty are pretty awesome. You know, we, we talked about the Higher Education Act, and this was the this was the issue for the first at least half of the organization's history. We were the HEA or we were the HEA organization. That's kind of what drug policy knew us as. Every single chapter in, in, in the country did something on the Higher Education Act, and we basically got rid of that law. 
it, it is now a, a shadow of its former self. There are very few students who are impacted by it these days. Uh, it only applies to felony offenses and to students who are currently enrolled in school. Uh, so we went from seeing literally tens of thousands of students denied aid every year to uh, a, a fairly small number. Now there's still work to be done, but we've grown so much larger that we're no longer just about the Higher Education Act. And in the ensuing years, how many of you guys have seen the, the, the ad campaigns, the ONDCP uh, anti, anti, what it, anti drug youth media campaign, anti youth campaign, should be called. Right? <laughs> These are the ads where if you, uh, you know, they tell you if you, if you, if you smoke marijuana, you get your fist stuck in your mouth, or try and outrun a guard dog, or your girlfriend will run off with a, a, an alien. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my favorites. <laughs> well, for years we lobbied. Congress, we got students to pass resolutions on their, on their campuses, and we lobbied Congress to try and get them to stop funding these stupid ads. You know, their, their own offices, the, 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 their own office, the Congressional Budget Office said, they did a study on it, and said the kids who watch these ads are more likely to do drugs than kids who don't. <laughs> so basically, teenage modern day reading matters. And eventually, we won. And now Congress gives no money to the ODCP for this campaign. They're still around, but it's not funded by our tax dollars. And that was something that was <laughs> A few years back, when I was uh, when I was executive director, uh, the Supreme Court heard a case called the uh, it was called the Bong Hits for Jesus case. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and the whole thing behind the case is that some kid in Alaska, when the Olympic torch parade came through, uh, they came throughout Anchorage, Alaska. This kid and his friend and his friends they unfurled this giant banner and said Bong Hits for Jesus because they wanted to get on TV, and they did. <laughs> and they're. They got suspended from school, and the one kid in particular, he was the only one that refused to, to put the sign down, he got suspended for a long time. Uh, he quoted Thomas Jefferson to his principal and got suspended for longer. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually this case made its, all, made its way all the way to the Supreme Court, and we filed an amicus brief, which, uh, which actually Alex Kreit, a uh, current board member and alumni, drafted that amicus Woo! brief for us. We knew the court was going to say that kids aren't allowed to promote drug use in school, but we said you have to protect the rights of kids to, protect, to, to, to support drug policy. Uh, because what the federal government was arguing was that you can't, you can't support, you, you, you think that, that teachers should have the right, administrators should have the right to stop students from even talking about drug policy reform or medical marijuana. And so we decided we're going to change the conversation. And we showed up at the Supreme Court that, that, uh, that day with a bunch of students, a lot of them from the University of Maryland, and some came from all across the country. And we unfurled a giant banner on the, on the uh, steps of the U.S. Supreme Court uh, in the exact same style as the Bong Hits for Jesus banner, and it said, free speech for students. Right? And the next day, all the reports about this, uh, about this case in the media, no longer was the image Bong Hits for Jesus, it was free speech for students. Every single paper, every news outlet in the country ran a picture. The court ruled that schools have the right to ban students from, speak, from, from promoting drug use as long as they protect their rights to speak about drug policy and drug policy reform. So our, I believe that our brief and our action actually influenced the results of a Supreme Court case, which is probably the single biggest free speech case uh, involving, uh, involved, well certainly the biggest free speech case involving drug use ever made to the Supreme Court, and SSDP made that happen. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. We've saved countless lives on college campuses all across the country because of the work that you guys have done in acting Good Samaritan policies. These are literally policies that save students' lives, and it's SSDP that, 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 that spearheaded this. And now we've got national organizations like DPA taking up the, the charge of this and getting these things passed in states all across the country. These are life-saving life policies that SSDP has gotten done. Uh, we've been featured in just about every uh, uh, news outlet in the country. And what, one of the things that really got SSDP built up in the first place is they did a big feature article on us in, in, in Rolling Stone magazine in two, uh, 2000, I believe. Uh, you know, pictures of, uh, of Sean Heller and, and Brian Brownlick, some of the original uh, organizers, uh, directors uh, at, uh, you know, at the Capitol, talking about drug policy. And it was, this is the new student movement. This is the new anti-war movement. This, the, this was this declared by Rolling Stone. Uh, and we went, we, we, and I, I had something I'm particularly proud of, just this year, the, the, the organization was granted uh, observer status in the United Nations, one of the only drug policy organizations in the world. <laughs> We've gone, this organization has gone from five chapters and a desk in the DRC net office, 
to the largest single issue student organization in the United States. We've got chapters on about 200 college campuses. We've got students here from all across the world. I don't even know how many countries we're in anymore. I've lost track. To, to think about that back in 1998, when it was really just, you know, a bunch of kids in a hotel room thinking, how, how are we going to organize students to, to, to where we become? I mean, it's, it's really astounding. Uh, but SSDP is so much larger than its accomplishments, than its legislative accomplishments. And I would like to say, Ethan Nagelman loves to say that we're building a movement, and we are building a movement. And SSDP is a part of that movement. But at SSDP, we're more than a movement. Yeah. We're family. Yeah. SSDP really is a family. Necessity, right? We're students from all over the country who are fighting some things that, 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 that at times are things that are, 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 are unpopular uh, or, or can be unpopular where you're dissuaded by teachers or parents uh, or, 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 uh, or other students saying, you know, oh, don't do that drug thing, right? you'll never be able to get a job, you'll never put that in your resume. Well, it's not nonsense, right? But that's hard, that's really hard, and that can be really dispiriting for, uh, for, for a young activist who really believes in something and they want to do something, and a lot of people they trust and they care about tell them you can't do that, right? And then you come here. Then you come to an SSDP conference, and you realize that there are students all over the country, and you come here as a student from Arkansas, and you meet students from Florida, and students from Oregon, and students from California, and Idaho, and New York, and Massachusetts, and all over the country who are working on the same issues that you're working on, and it, it, it brings us together, and it provides us with a sense of cohesion and unity that you don't get, I don't think, in most other social justice movements because of the stigma. That stigma's not necessarily there. There's nothing to, there, this isn't to knock any other clubs or any other social justice causes, but SSDP becomes so much bigger. We are really a sum of all of our parts, and our parts are incredible, because our parts are all of you out here. They're all of the individuals that make up students with sensible drug policy. And we come to this for so many different reasons, right? Some of us come here because we're motivated by harm reduction and providing services that will save lives on our campuses, or we're motivated by marijuana legalization, or, or libertarian ideals of freedom, or racial justice, or social justice. But we all agree on one thing, right? We all agree that we must end this destructive war on drugs and replace it with a system based in common sense, compassion, and reason. <laughs> We're a family because for so many of our students, right, because you have that, you get that need to come together on your campus with these people, and I will say that for most SSD peers that I've encountered through the years, are generally not part of the fraternity, sorority network, or some of the traditional social networks on their campuses. Although I will say that if you're excluding fraternity and sorority members from your chapters, you're doing yourselves a tremendous disservice uh, because they've got incredible contacts generally within student government, tremendous influence, and they really like to party. They can use some harm reduction services. <laughs> So let's be welcoming here, diversity of thought, diversity of everything. Uh, but SSDP truly does become the social network for a lot of these students. And it, it, that to me is something really special. And I think it's evidenced by that literally does, I think there's something like 50 SSDP alumni who are here at this conference and who come back every year, year, year after year, long after graduation, sometimes, <laughs> yeah, 15 years. <laughs> and these are alumni who donate to the organization to make sure that the next generation of students have the same opportunities that they did, right? Sometimes, SSD peers become real life families, and a lot of relationships have started at, uh, at SSDP conferences through the years, and I'm sure it's, uh, this, this will be no exception. Uh, you know, I, I can say that uh, <laughs> if it wasn't for SSDP, I never would have met my, my wonderful wife, Jenny, who we have... Uh, The, uh, the president of the Roosevelt University chapters, who was a master's student at the time, and we met at a strategy summit in 2006. Uh, and she would love to be here today, but unfortunately she, she can't be here today. She's nine months pregnant and uh, is being <laughs> I have to say, she's doing our community is April 20th. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, Adam, actually, Adam is also here, so we both got our cell phones on vibrate. His wife is due on April 19th. Uh, Chris Lockhart's wife is due in June, I believe. So next year we're gonna we're gonna start the first SSDP nursery yeah. chapter. <laughs> Director and Carolyn Lemon, a former chapter member and also an office manager, uh, they just had the first, I would say, full, full SSDP baby just this past week. Uh, Nathaniel, Nathaniel, Nathaniel Rogers. Uh, so yeah, we're really, we're, we are literally building the next generation of SSDP here. <laughs> 
So look, we, we, we are family, and like I said, we are some of our parts, and our parts are our people, right? We are an amazing organization because of the people that make up SSDP, and I'm gonna call some people out here and maybe embarrass some people, but you know, we are, we are Chris Lotlicker, we are Sean Heller, the people who, who brought this organization to, the, to, to, to life. We are Dan Golden who has served in basically every position that you could possibly serve in for SSTP, numerous staff positions, and just one who wants to be a millionaire, so I expect those donations to start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. $500 donation just for the honor of introducing them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're Alex Kreit, who, uh, who graduated and, 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 and later, later went on to write the brief that, that I think basically won the Bonkets for Jesus case in, in our favor. We're Rebecca Salzman, who can't be here today, who is uh, who's running for bar commissioner in the city in, 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 in the city of Oakland, and I have no doubt will one day be the, the mayor of Oakland. Uh, you know, we're, we're Rebecca Salzman, we're, we're, uh, we're Scarlett Swerdlow, who also is not here, a former executive director who really helped keep the organization alive after September 11th, when it became really hard to organize around issues that weren't uh, that weren't directly related to the war on terror and uh, and, 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 and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. We are, we're Arena Alexander, where's Arena? She's gotta be in here. Chair of the Board of Directors, uh, who also just got every candidate on record in New Hampshire on this, on this issue. We're John Perry, who also couldn't be here today, but John, after, after serving as outreach director, and who also performed admirably in New Hampshire a few years ago, he started the Change Dollar, he now works for Change Dollar Work Petition, and start, uh, works for Change Dollar Work, and started the petition, petition that blew up the Trayvon Martin issue into a real national story that was done by an SSDP alumni. You know, or Troy Gaten, who, who graduated from from uh, from STP from from American University and went on to work for basically every drug policy organization in the in the country, uh, and is now working on bringing institutional investors into the medical cannabis space. Right, we're John Decker. Uh, we're John in the back. John Decker, who in 2006 we had. A, an overzealous general manager decided he wanted to kick out every SSD peer at the Holiday Inn Hotel near Georgetown Law. John Decker decided to miss basically a half a day of the conference to sit in the hotel lobby and tail the general manager to eavesdrop on him to, to catch him doing something that he shouldn't be doing, which we did, right? And he ended up staying in that hotel. <laughs> Celentano, who, uh, who, who, who brings a perspective as SDP of talking about providing safe spaces for people in the recovery community that, frankly, the organization has not been very good at through our years, and, and because of her advocacy work, uh, I think that we are, we, are, we are really doing our part to try and make that community who is so important to our overall struggle feel welcome as a part of our organization. So many people about the value of a cell phone camera. <laughs> who uh, had a quick story about Justin at uh, a Northeast Regional Conference at Boston University. Uh, he ran a training on how to videotape police during police encounters. Well, that night we had an after party, and the police showed up to bust it at somebody's house. And within 20 seconds, there were 30 kids with their cell phones surrounding <laughs> these cops, following them all around the party. Right? And they, you know, they, they, they basically left us alone. They had no idea what to do. <laughs> Right, Google Justin Holmes, there's some incredible, incredible videos out there. Right, we're, we're Froggy Vasquez, Froggy over here. Right? Right. Froggy, we brought, I don't know if you've seen the, the group that Froggy's brought with him uh, to this conference today, but brought a group, was it 20 students from, from Los Angeles? Something like that. Something like that, right? <laughs> Young people who are who are you know, part of a community that have been the most impacted by the war on drugs, probably of any community in America, and brought them here and said, "I want to be a part of your organization. I want to bring my community to this organization because it's going to help my community and it's going to help your community. It's going to help all of us grow and be stronger." So thank you, Froggy, for all the work you've done. <laughs> Just a more, I know we're running out of time. We're Tom Angel. Yeah. Uh, 
who, uh, who, who went on from running a chapter uh, in Rhode Island to, uh, to, to doing press work for SSDP, to doing lobbying work for SSDP, uh, and, uh, and, and now serves as Leap's media director and is single-handedly the reason why Leap is in just about every publication uh, in the country on a daily basis. Uh, he's, 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 he is the media reason why the drug war is going to end one day. I, I, I want to mention, and obviously for sake of time, I'm not going to, but I will mention one more. We're Stacia Cosner. <laughs> who, who I've had the, the, the pleasure to watch grow from an 18 year old freshman who was fresh off of a possession bust uh, and, and just decided she's going to get involved in something to becoming uh, possibly the, the hardest working and most successful chapter leader that I've encountered in, in 13 years at SSDP and it's been just an absolute pleasure to watch develop and blossom into a true national leader in this issue. Uh, I can only, I, 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 I'm filled with joy to imagine what's going to become of you in the years to come. Uh, it's been a true pleasure to watch you develop, like I say, from a, from a freshman to, uh, into a real leader in this organization. At, at, at the University of Maryland, at the Fun Dome, at Georgetown Law, at, at, in Long Beach, in, in Albuquerque, at all the conferences that have come before. We are all of those spaces. We are a giant family. And it's all of these people in this room today, all of the current students here, you are all going to go for go forward and forge your own paths and win your own victories in this in this in this eternal, hopefully not eternal, struggle <laughs> to end the war on drugs. <laughs> Who someday one of you or somebody in this room will be up here on the stage just like I am telling stories about how you did your part to end the drug war and your compatriots did their part to end the drug war. And I, and I, and I look forward with great pride and anticipation to the gathering that we will one day have, the SSDP Memorial Conference and Reunion, where generations of SSDP leaders and activists will get together and return and talk about how this incredible family, together, united, the sum of our parts, ended the war on drugs once and for all. Thank you.